Hello and welcome to the Academy. My name is uh, Gavin Kowser. I'm one of the English teachers here in um, the Dublin Academy of Education. And basically what we're going to do today is we're going to have a little look at some poetry. So effectively what we're going to do in kind of 70 to 75 minutes in this kind of free online course is to really give you a kind of a sample and a flavour of how we do things here within the school. So in kind of 70 to 75 short minutes, I know that sounds kind of oxymoronic starting off by talking about kind of that extended period of time as short, but we'll, we'll get through it collectively together and we will get through it nice and quickly, is we'll have a little look and see how much we can effectively cover within this time, all right, within this time frame. And effectively what we're gonna try and do is, we're gonna try and chalk up as much of 17 and a half percent of our entire English grade as possible. So that's our goal today, guys. That's what we're gonna look at. And hopefully by the end of this, uh, by the end of this little video, you guys walk away with, if not, uh, I suppose a majority of that, but certainly a part of it as well. All right, so guys, this is typically how I run my classes within the school. So anybody kind of looking to sign up to the grinds this year, Typically what we'll do is we'll have one column on the board. You can see obviously we have three working boards in front of us here and that's typically the way it is in our classrooms. Uh, and this is effectively what we try and get covered within the class. And then obviously then we go through our working bo boards in, in conjunction with the notes as well. So guys, this is who I am. As I said there, my name is Gavin. I've been teaching here in the school for the last six years. And uh, yeah, so I've been teaching Leaving Cert English for the last uh, 12 years. So again, We've, hopefully I'll try and get, a, 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 I suppose, a good chunk of that information across, okay? We are, as you said, gonna look at poetry, so 17.5%. And again, where that 17.5% is made up, we're gonna look at unseen poetry. This is something, guys, that is often neglected by students. It's often left till last, uh, which is a good thing, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about timing and kind of paper management a little bit later. But it's often left to last, and in some cases, it's neglected totally, and people just, uh, I suppose, uh, take it upon themselves not to take on the unseen poem at all and try and amalgamate the time that they would have spent on that topic uh, to elsewhere in the paper. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about how that's something that you 100% should not do, that this effectively, guys, is a very achievable, very obtainable 5% for all of us watching out there, okay? So we're gonna start with a little bit of unseen poetry <clears throat> and then what we're gonna move on to in the second half of today's class is we're gonna look at our study poetry, okay? And we're gonna look at getting this 50 marks, 12.5%, and we're gonna look at Sylvia Platt, one of the predicted poets we often talk about here in school. We talk about predictions, we know how they're so important to you guys watching at home. Uh, and again, we've been, thankfully, we've been very successful with our predictions over the last number of years. Um, obviously, con considering COVID and uh, the leading are being canceled, obviously there was nothing to predict this year. But certainly the year before that, we, we were very successful. We do feel that Sylvia Platt has a really, really good chance of being on the paper for you guys come June. So we'll have a little look at her as a poet. We'll walk you through kind of her poetic voice, her techniques. We'll have a little look at a sample of her poetry because again, normally in the grinds, what we tend to do is we tend to spend two evening classes on a poet. So we might spend Thursday of one week looking at the beginnings of Sylvia Platt, first three poems, again, poetic voice or style. And then in the second class, the following week, we look at the following three poems or our second set of three poems. And then we look at our sample answers and we look at, uh, again, that exemplar material that we give to you guys. And you can see that are at the back of the notes, there's two sample essays given to you guys in the handout that you have now in front of you on Sylvia Platt, one of which is a really phenomenal essay. And I'll talk to you about that again at the end of today's class as well. And how we use sample essays as well. You know, gone are the days of simply rote learning and regurgitating the essays. That's not something that we encourage here. What we'll do is we'll look at that essay, uh, we'll look at the two essays towards the end of this class and see how we're gonna go about using them, all right? In order to start today's class, in order to launch right into it, we are gonna look at why I've written kind of P-I-S-S -S on the board and explain that to you guys. Um, this is an acronym that is very, very important to all of you at home. And again, if you are looking to try and get 17.5%, which can be done by the way, you guys can get all 17.5% of these two topics within the leading search, we'll look at this acronym pattern, imagery, sensuousness, and suggestiveness, and why it is so significant going forward. We're also gonna look at structure of our answers. We're gonna look at timing, things of that nature as well, okay? What we really try and do here in the academy, guys, is obviously, the, you know, starting with poetry, it's an area that holds a huge amount of fear, a huge amount of trepidation for individuals, you know, 
how many poets do I study? How many poems do I study per poet? You know, what we try and do here in the academy is try to alleviate that fear and, and I suppose the struggles with poetry and really just map it out in a nice and clear and concise manner and say, listen, these are the poets you should look at. These are the five to six poets that you should look at. And here's the six poems that you, sh you should look at per poet as well. That's a little proviso there, guys. That's a little side note. Because I'm aware that in a number of day schools, you guys are told that you only need three or four poems per poet. Uh, that's simply untrue. I'll show you today in the department marking scheme where they've actually said that candidates, you guys, now you're all candidates uh, for June, candidates actually need six poems per poet. You need a representative selection of poetry per poet. So make sure, guys, this is the first little uh, rule I would say to you guys, the first little side note, make sure we're lo looking at six poems per poet. You don't need to know all six poems in the same volume of detail as each other, uh, but you do need to be able to link them uh, and use them, I suppose, within an answer. If it's a case that you're a slower writer, it might be a case that you write on five poems and mention a sixth, which is a very easy thing to do as well. So we'll talk about that as we go on today, guys. All right, we're gonna jump into the notes and we'll have a little look at page four of the notes. We can kind of skip over the contents and a little bit kind of about who I am and etc. all at the beginning of the notes. And we'll, we'll start on page four and we'll have a little look at unseen poetry, okay? So the first thing I would say is at the top of the page, and I'll ask you kind of to do this kind of systemically or periodically as we go through today's class, is just to highlight a couple of things and just to jot down your own little freehand notes. The top of this page here is with unseen poetry. I would say that you guys, again, make sure that you take it on as a task. And again, make sure you stick to your timing. So these are little buzzwords that we stick on the, the task, the timing, and make sure above all else that we attempt it, all right? Because as I said, this is an area of 5% of our grade here where we can actually get a significant number of marks by just putting pen to paper. In the department, in terms of examiners, we know that you have a very finite amount of time to take on this task. Uh, we're not monsters, so we understand that if you kind of attempt and if you say, you know, it was my understanding of or my initial reading of this poem, this is how I felt or this is what I thought, again, you'll be heavily rewarded for that. You back that up with the technical aspects of poetry because that's what it's all about. Pattern, imagery, sensuousness and suggestiveness. You back it up with the technical aspects. Again, you'll be heavily rewarded. For example, you know, I felt that this poem was an incredibly sensuous piece of work. Okay, or the imagery contained in stanza one really spoke to me. These kind of, I suppose, elements linking, you know, the technical aspects with the impact. And impact, guys, I'll throw on the board here because impact is the most important word for your entire English Leaving Cert, both paper one and paper two. Okay, the individuals that respond to what you read in terms of, even if you look at King Lear, for example, you look at the myriad of different texts that are involved in your comparative, you look at all the different poems, whatever it is, if you respond constantly with your thoughts and your feelings, to give you synonyms of that, guys, in terms of your opinion, and your emotion, you will be heavily rewarded for that, okay? Especially when it comes to unseen poetry, because again, you have 22, I'll walk you through your timing now in a few moments time, you have 22 to 25 minutes max to take on a poem you've never seen before. So it's incredibly interpretive, all right? It's incredibly kind of almost superficial. You're trying to draw as much information from something that you've never seen before. So again, we're looking for a response, all right? We're looking for your thoughts and your feelings overall, the impact that the poem had on you, okay? More of that as we go on, all right? The final little thing that I'll say about in terms of P-I-S-S -S and why it's so significant, English, guys, is made up of categories of language. Now, there's a lot of stuff that's going on here today, guys, that I'm assuming, and I know they say never assume, but I am assuming that you guys are familiar with. You know, at the end of the day, you've, you've covered fifth year, you're now starting sixth year, you should have a good chunk of material covered in terms of your own day schools. But what I would say is, if you haven't come across your five categories of language before, you know, and I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit here in terms of I can't spend a huge amount of time, this is very much paper one, this is very much the absolute basis, our basics, you know, beginning of fifth year. But if you haven't heard that before, this is something that we cover at the beginning of our grinds, you know, the first two to three weeks, we really establish, you know, our English categories of language. If you haven't heard this before, 
again, we need to consider the grinds. If you haven't considered, you know, heard this information about the technical aspects of language, and again, the technical aspects of poetry, again, it's something that's covered consistently and um, in a huge amount of depth within the grinds as well. Our five categories of language, guys, as I said, uh, just to skirt over, our language of argument, persuasion, aesthetic, which brings in poetry, aesthetic language. Okay, language of information and language of narrative. If something looks good and sounds good, guys, just to simplify things completely, we classify it as aesthetic language, all right? And that's effectively what we're doing with regards to poetry. When we dissect poetry, we are looking to see, well, what looks good and what sounds good? What kind of imagery is created? Is it created from a sound or an aural technical aspect? Or is it created from a visual, visual, tech, uh, a visual kind of technical aspect as well? All right, let's have a little look, guys. We'll have a little look at the notes, as I said top of the page, Unseen Poetry, we have that task written down, we have the idea that we're gonna, we're gonna attempt it, and then we very much mind our timing as well. Couple of things that I'd ask us to highlight, just as we're starting, because this is again something that's not delivered consistently throughout day schools, that you're not given, I suppose, the parameters with which your exams are corrected, you're not being told in terms of what, I suppose, the examiners are saying, what the chief examiner is saying, etc., etc. We have a little bit of language here, a couple of things to note. It's in the italics, guys, top of page four. Students should be able to read poetry conscious of its specific mode of using language as an artistic medium. What I would ask you to do, guys, beside that little bit there, is write in the term aesthetic language. All that is doing is mapping out the fact that poetry falls under one of these five categories of language. The second thing I'd ask you to highlight there is Reward the candidate's awareness of pattern nature of language. You might drop down hashtag one beside that. So the pattern nature of language. Uh, it's imagery, hashtag two. Sensuous language, number three. And then it's suggestiveness, number four. All right, guys, this is the language that is given to us from the department marking scheme, okay? That is why we here in the academy use this acronym. That's why we tell our students to shape and mold their answers around these four technical terms. Can you imagine, put yourself in the, in the examiner's shoes, guys. Put yourself in their shoes with two different scripts and one person writes, you know, I really liked, you know, the imagery within this poetry because it made me feel nice. Or I liked this imagery because it was bright and sunny. Versus, you know, I gravitated towards the sensuous material. Or the poet's suggestive qualities really come through in the third stanza. That's the type of information that we're looking at or we're looking for or from you guys as candidates, okay? We're looking for those types of statements. And again, it makes our lives very, very easy when I see as a topic sentence, and topic sentence, hopefully you guys will be familiar with topic sentences in terms of optics, really, really good way to get significant marks. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later when we start looking at our sample material. But can you imagine a topic sentence that reads the sensuous nature of this poem, etc.? Like, as an examiner, I've been told here, guys, top of page four, to find this information, have candidates alluded to or mention these, these topics, and then you have it there in terms of a topic sentence. So again, the examiner just gives it a big tick, really strong coding at the side of the page, and then they move through the paragraph and then on, to the, on into the next one, okay? So be very, very clever, guys. Use this terminology in your responses, all right? We'll, we'll dissect these four terms, we'll talk about what kind of information is found within these four terms as we go. we we'll use them as topic sentences. Use that actual vernacular, guys. Use that vocabulary in your answer, okay? That is what our department is saying. So again, what does this all mean? You have it there on, on your script in front of you. Effectively, we stick to the aesthetic language, we talk about the components of, of the language, that structural element, and again, we use it in the correct fashion as well. Okay, you can see at the bottom of page four there, guys, we just talk about pattern, imagery, uh, sensuousness, and suggestiveness as well. There is one thing there, there's a couple of bullet points which I will pause on for a second in the middle of page four where it says, to get a good grade at leaving cert poetry, I suppose you need to be able to read and quote from the poetry. With regards to unseen poetry, that's very easy. You have the poem in front of you. You're just making sure that everything that you lift off the page, everything that you elect to put down on your own script, makes sense that you are validating and you're qualifying the points that you're looking to make with relevant information and that's a really strong point there guys if you want to even write that word down beside that first bullet point there relevant it's all about relevant information if you make a phenomenal point and i as an examiner reading go wow that's incredible and then you include a quote from the text 
that is in no way applicable to what you've just said. It's jarring and it's certainly not a H1, H2 standard. Okay, so make sure that we're looking for relevant information. Understand what the poetry is about. If you want to write down beside that there, that's a thematic angle. All right, make sure that you understand your themes. From an unseen poetry perspective, it's interpretive. You won't lose a hell of a lot of marks, you know, if you get the theme or the message of the poem wrong, as long as you validate your own opinion. But with regards to studied poetry, you have to understand each individual poem and understand which, what, what I suppose, in our case, what we're gonna look at, what is Sylvia Plath trying to say? What is she trying to put across within her own poetry, okay? Express your opinion about how well the poet expressed their thoughts through the language they used. And not to flog a dead horse, guys, but to go back to it again, it is the most significant word for you as candidates. Impact, impact, impact. Respond. That's what we're looking to see in our answers. We want to see you guys responding to the material that's down in front of us, okay? So that's effectively what we're gonna try and do, guys. Last little thing in terms of when it says read and quote from the poetry, just to jump back to that first bullet point, if we are talking about studying poetry, something I'd ask you to write down now is that you need eight to 10 reference points per studied poem, okay? So eight to 10 reference points. Gone are the days of having to learn an entire poem off by heart. It's a, it's a waste of time and it's simply unnecessary, okay? What we try and do here in the academy, a little mantra of ours, certainly in the English department, is to work smarter, not harder, all right? And that'll involve learning eight to 10 reference points. And the word that I tend to use a lot within my classes is, malleable all right make sure the information you look at is malleable as in you learn a quote goes for king lear goes for your single text as well that you learn a quote that is applicable for a number of different questions all right you don't learn a quote say for king lear was it hi my name is king lear because it's only applicable to a character question instead you look at you know how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child and now, now what we're looking at is you're looking at character because of Lear saying it. You're looking at the relationship between himself and his daughters. You're looking at the idea of filial ingratitude. You're looking at animalistic imagery and the theme of good versus evil, natural versus unnatural. So you're looking at a, a myriad of different potential question topics that are there by simply looking at one quote. Again, it becomes incredibly malleable, incredibly useful. Same goes for poetry, guys. We're very mindful of that going forward, okay? All right, so we're gonna clear the board here a little bit and we're gonna start taking on our topics with regards to pattern imagery, sensuousness, and suggestiveness. The first element, guys, that you make sure that you note is that pattern, aesthetic language, and poetry in particular, even if it is free verse, even if you get a very unconventional poem in terms of its structure, if it looks more like a work of narrative, for example, um, it still doesn't change the fact that there is pattern in there somewhere, all right? And even if it's a lack of pattern, as I said, even if it is unconventional, much more kind of narrative-esque, that in turn gives it a type of pattern, okay? So there's a number of things that we need to take note of with regards to pattern, okay? The first thing, which is something I used to talk about a lot within my grind classes, and I used to say, you know what, you know, for some reason students aren't doing this, they're not talking about this particular area of focus, and, and you know, I don't know why they're not doing it because it's the easiest thing that they could do. I need to stop saying that because now my students have started taking note of it, they have started to implement this within their answers, and they have begun to, to get rewarded for it, okay? It used to be that 1% of candidates are doing this, again, it's a much stronger percentage now, okay? but it is the easiest thing to do when you in initially look at a poem, be it unseen or studied. You ask yourself, the form, you look at the form versus the content. Guys, a synonym for form is just the structure is the shape of the poem, okay? And you ask yourself, is it conventional? A lot of us will know what a conventional poem looks like. You know, your typical four stanzas, four lines per stanza, maybe even two stanzas, you know, five lines each, whatever is that if it looks like a poem, we describe it as conventional, okay? If it's much more on the narrative style, maybe a, a Robert Frost-esque type of poem, for example, where it just kind of goes on, there's a huge amount of enjambment, there's no line breaks, for example, well, then we describe the poem as being incredibly unconventional, okay? A couple of terms there. We have uh, synonyms as well for you guys, uniform and non-uniform, for example, all right? This will be a great way to start a paragraph, great way to start an introduction into a poem where you begin with, you know, saying that Sylvia Plath here has written an incredibly unconventional poem in terms of both structure 
and content. And that's where the H1, H2 guys will, will find themselves in an ability to talk about this information here, not only just for the shape of the poem and what the poem actually looks like, but also the content as well. What we're gonna do is, guys, we're gonna look at one poem today a little bit later. Hopefully a number of you guys will have already looked at this poem before. The poem Mirror by Sylvia Platt. And that poem, to look at it, is incredibly conventional. Two stanzas, I think it's 10 lines per stanza each. It looks like a poem. However, you have in that poem, you have a mirror, the voice of a mirror talking to us, the personification that's being used, okay? And it is reflecting another individual. And that individual is Sylvia Platt, a younger Sylvia Platt, aging dramatically and rapidly into an older Sylvia Platt. So in terms of the content of that poem, it becomes an incredibly unconventional poem. Okay, so guys, what I would say to you is when you start looking at poetry, ask yourself, is this conventional or is this unconventional? Okay, another aspect of pattern. So that's our first aspect of pattern. Another aspect of pattern is, guys, our sound techniques. Okay, so the repetitive sound techniques that are being used within our poetry. All right, so I'll put that in, in terms of a repetition instead, instead of rep repetitive. Okay, our sound techniques. Now again, we have normally in terms of the grinds, guys, because obviously I've been talking at you for nearly, uh, nearly 25 minutes now. Normally what I would do is I'd pause in terms of the grinds and I would say, you know what guys, have a little think about it yourself here. What sound techniques are you familiar with with regards to poetry? And even if you're at home now, if you want to do that, and you wanna pause the video and have a little think and kind of fill in the blanks yourself rather than me kind of telling you everything, you should certainly do that. But what we'll do is, you know, pause the video now if you want. What we'll do is we'll keep, you know, continue on. Make sure you're kind of thinking about what terms or what, I suppose, sound techniques add in that repetition. So terms like alliteration, assonance, sibilance, for example, consonance. You know, those are the four. I'll throw those up on the board there, guys. Alliteration. Um, assonance, sibilance. And as I said there, like those will be three that I would expect you guys to know. Repetition of our normal, uh, our consonants, normal letters, repetition of our vowels, repetition of S and C there. Uh, again, something that's often forgotten, you know, the cynical snake visited the circus. Perfect example of sibilance there as well. Consonants is one I mentioned, guys, which is the endings. Uh, consonants is the endings of terms that are included within uh, within our poems. Uh, you know, one of our junior sir poems that you guys might remember. You know, in all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, gutter ring, choking, drowning. That um, dulcet de decorum est poem. Again, that ing, ing, ing is consonants there as well. Guys, what we also have is, and a number of us might have jotted this down when we are pausing the video there. We have terminology like onomatopoeia, for example. Onomatopoeia, guys, just as a heads up in terms of examiners, is a real red or white flag. You identified an unseen poem. We immediately go, wow, that's a white flag. You know, really, really good, excellent. And then you misspell it. Again, that's a real red flag. It tells us that you're kind of 60, 70 percent or that you haven't gone that extra step to make sure that you understand how, I suppose, how to spell the term. OK, as he looks on, kind of like just making sure that he has, in fact, spelled it correctly. But onomatopoeia there, guys, it's in the notes, obviously. Now, again, you think about, like, why am I going to sign up? Why might I sign up to, to Gavin Kelser's grinds? You know, what is he going to give us that's going to put me into a different kind of stratosphere? How am I going to get out of kind of the average grade? The average grade, guys, if you're unfamiliar with this, uh, in terms of the country, is a H4. That's the average grade in English. The second most common grade is a H5. So there's a real black hole there of a H4, H5, a real black hole of mediocrity as we describe it here, okay? We wanna make sure that we can push ourselves out of that black hole. Again, if a H4 and a H5 is the absolute best that you can do, that's absolutely perfect and that's incredible. It's a great result, okay? If we're looking to try and put ourselves into that H3 and then on again into that H2, H1 kind of stratosphere, as I said, we have to look at things like onomatopoeia, for example. We say, yeah, that's really good. It's fine. What we do, though, is we branch out and we consider how can I separate myself potentially from my best friend who I sit beside in English class in my day school. How do I separate myself from them? Well, then what you do is you look at terminology like euphony and cacophony, and you start thinking about terms like, okay, it's, 
you know, this is an automatic, onomatopoeic term. This is, you know, bang, crash, slap, for example. It's adding to the mood. It's adding to the atmosphere of the piece. But why is it adding to the atmosphere of the piece? Well, because of the, the sounds are incredibly cacophonous. From an aural perspective, it's incredibly harsh on the ear. Now we're separating ourselves, right? Terminology like cacophony. You think about the terminology, or, or maybe a little one-liner from a poem, lake water lapping, and you say that whimsical, magical idea, again, is being given to us with that euphonous qualities, the euphony terms, or the euphonic terms there that are being used. <coughs> Excuse me, within that poem, okay? So again, that's how we separate ourselves a little bit further, okay? If you need to, as I said, pause the video at any stage, take little screenshots. As I said, I have them in the notes here. We're going through the board work, as I said, to, to give ourselves a, a flavor and a feel of how the grinds work.